So just as a very brief introduction, my name is Angela Kachari, <laughs> I'm education here at Morgan Smith. Um, I've been with the firm for over 20 years and um, in the sector for probably longer than that. And this session is born from the multiple questions that we have had um, to do with VAT um, and all the things that come with it, um, VAT on fees. And on my left is Debbie. Hi, Debbie Jennings. Good afternoon. I'm a VAT director at Moore Kingston Smith. Been here uh, seven years. I've been in VAT since the late 90s. Enjoy it. Really enjoy not for profit at education and work with this lovely lady on a regular basis. Fantastic. Um, can I a bit of housekeeping? Um, as you all know, many of you have used the QA. We will try and pick up questions as we go along. Um, if we don't get to you, don't worry. Debbie and I later on will take some of the questions that we've got if we haven't managed to answer them, and we will recirculate a QA, uh, sort of the frequently asked questions um ultimately. So um, not to worry if, if we don't answer everything that you want answered. So the first thing I just wanted to cover off was really, um, we are taking this seminar as a given that fees in advance, yeah. it's all good, thank you. thank you, that fees in advance, oh, sorry, fees in advance, I'm going ahead <laughs> of myself, fees, um, so VAT on fees will go ahead. We're going to take the, a very big assumption that the Labour government will come in and that they will put VAT on fees. So one of the things I just want to quickly explore is when do we think that is? And with the view that we think there probably will be an election, just say probably the latest at the end of 24, um, the first opportunity that this could affect our schools will be in the year 25, 26. So I just wanted to gauge your opinion, Debbie, um, whether that is a feasible timeline for something like this to come in. Yeah. Thank you. We've known since 2017 that the Labour Party has said that they're going to introduce VAT on education, been very vocal about it. We haven't seen any specific details, um, but it's highly likely it's going to be in the manifesto and maybe when the election's announced, the manifesto will go into more details. So let's think it through. So there's an election next November and then the Labour Party win with the majority so are the the government no coalition and then they have a budget in March and then we'll see the detail of what the proposed changes will look like and then we would expect a transitional period um, for the full rollout so in the September of that year 25 okay. and with the full school year to follow so that's the ballpark I would have thought you can realistically assume. So, so another question that we get asked multiple mm -hmm. times, if that is going to happen, how feasible is it for Labour to put VAT on our independent school fees? You know, how quickly can they do it? You know, education, for example, is wider than the independent schools. It is our higher education. It is our universities. Mm. It is our small disabled school down the road that is financed um, by state and yeah. private monies. How easy is it for Labour to do this? Yeah, so what you've got, you've got state schools and free schools and academies where you don't pay for education. They have a special VAT regime and they can recover all their VAT because essentially it's a non-business activity. But looking at VAT, it's... It is a European tax. We've had VAT when we went into the common market, as it was, and that was the ultimate piece of law. The, the VAT rules under the EU were the supreme law, and we have it in our own UK law. Uh, so that's where it sits. It's the supply of education and goods and services closely re related to education by an eligible body. Eligible body includes schools, colleges, FE, certain charities. So if I was writing the legislation to accommodate this, I would take out independent schools from the definition of eligible body, which means that supplies by them then become revert to the, the fallback position, which is VAT at the standard rate, which we have in the UK at the moment. And is that easy for them to do? With the view that, you know, when I mentioned things like the, you know, the small disabled school down the road that is funded by both state and private sector, would that fall into independent or state? Well, if you pay in fees, because even an independent school with bursaries, if you pay in fees and if you want to attack, well, it's an aggressive word, but if you want to focus on that particular activity, then you rewrite the VAT rules 
in the legislation to capture that. So it's almost like uh, uh, the okie cokey your colleges stay in the exemption, your independents go out. Uh, it's really how you rewrite the rules. Okay. And you mentioned uh, earlier on about uh, transitional rules. Mm -hmm. What does that look like if we've gone through the timeline of an election in 24, impact on our schools 25, 26? Does that include the transitional rules? And um, what are transitional rules? Yeah. Some of the, so the... if I was sitting in the, um, in the seat of the independent school at the moment, I only know the headline stuff. I'm looking at something like this, which is people who've, who've got, given it their best shot of, of guessing, if you like. But then you, what I would expect to see is that the manifesto fleshes it out. So that's the next bit of a giveaway of information by the Labour Party. They win the election for our assumption here. And then you get the budget. That's when you start getting the meat. Then you start looking at, well, what's this going to look like? And that will then indicate when the rules are going to change. So I think you, the transitional period will effectively be, I would say, is the March budget in 25 to the implementation in September, which is six months, which is about, you know, sort of reasonable for a transitional period. Because it's going to have to be a lot of things that's going to change. A lot of accounting system change, pricing, communication, you know, blah, blah, blah. And so with that in mind, we know that our bodies within the sector from the ISC, you know, they're going to want to challenge this. We mm. already know that they are, you know, fighting a battle with, with, with Labour on this. Will that have an impact on any adoption um, trigger points? As like such? an appeal you're talking yeah, about. Yeah, absolutely. But when you, when you appeal something at the moment, if you appeal something about VAT, then the appeal of the courts and the tribunal is appealing law that's on the statute books. But what we'd be looking at here is that the, it be, to become a law, it's going to have to be debated in the House and passed through the Lords. That's where you can try and bring it down, I guess, and, and influence the potential impact. It's, it's in that debated stage while it's still, uh, it's still a work in progress. OK, so I think... If we take the view that it is coming in, um, we've got a good idea that possibly 25, 26 will be the impact year for our schools. What can we do about it? And I think one of the key things that has been discussed in numerous ways, in numerous fashions, is this fees in advance yeah. element um, and what that means. Already, we know that schools receive money in advance. Is there an opportunity to utilise what they already do and I say very loosely, I don't want to use the word avoid, but as quite rightly you say, mitigate any future VAT implications. OK, over to you. so what we're looking at is how do we effectively do a prepayment, let's call it that, to take advantage or to live with the rules as they are now, the exemption. It's, it's very common for these sort of things to be done. But if we look at the composition fee scheme that schools have, that's essentially a lump sum, a prepayment, but at the essentially a top down. So I pay for a relative, but it's a lump sum. And then the school slices and dices attributable to the education. For this, for a prepayment to have legs and be strong and to, to stand up to scrutiny, it's got to be a bottom up. It's got to be, I am prepaying this amount of money specifically for these terms, for this child, quantifiable on these terms. So it's, it'll ramp up to a lump sum because that will be the total. But you can't just say, there's some money, there's a lump sum, there's my prepayment, but it's just a lump sum. It's, it's too undefined. It must be specific. There must be a link with something, a future supply. You are prepaying for that, not I will give you the money and then you can slice it and dice it as life goes on. So just to explore that a bit, just so that our schools understand, if the fees in 23, 24, sorry, 24, 25 are 5,000 pounds a term, if someone wanted to pay for a year one, they would be giving the school 15,000. In 25, 26, if the fees are now five and a half thousand, if they wanted to pay two years up front, they would be giving the school 31 and a half thousand mm -hmm. pounds. If they did give the school 31 and a half thousand pounds, because the school has some information to dictate that fees might be at the five and a half thousand pounds. Right. Mark, yeah. 
and VAT came in in 25-26, does that mean specifically the school that is now subject to VAT on its fees would not have to apply the VAT to that second year? Okay, so looking at that. So if I, if I was paying now, I, it's got to have some sort of commercial legs, not only for the purpose of avoiding using that uh, mitigating VAT. And you would normally expect there to be some sort of incentivization. If you pay up now, you will get a 5% discount. There's got to be something that gets it over the line for more than just VAT, for VAT mitigation. So what, what you would need to do is if you say, yep, yeah, there's the meaningful basis, how this is costed out per child, Per, it, it's tied in to what you would normally see and it's got a commercial edge and you can see why, I think you could be fine. It's, it's as much robust planning, detail, implementation, and, and it stands up to scrutiny. So this is why schools have been, um, or certainly some schools have been thinking about encouraging parents. And certainly I know some schools are already fielding calls from parents about paying fees in advance. But what they can't do is rely on these old composite fee scheme yeah. agreements that they have in place, which, as you said, there is a difference between bottom up and top down. Mm -hmm. And that's probably quite crucial for this mm. fees in advance scheme to almost work for that purposes. Yeah. Because the, the lump sum, top down, does not work. The bottom, top, going up to a total is much more uh, uh, ability to be taken as an acceptable VAT planning tool. So the school will only estimate their fees. Uh, okay, but there must be a basis on which the estimates are made. There's got to be a meaningful uh, process and quantification. And as I say, you do have to have also the basis for incentivizing somebody to make a payment in advance. If it's only for the mitigation of VAT and that only, then that's too artificial. So I know for a fact that my schools can at least plan forward a minimum <laughs> of five years. Some are really good and plan forward for 10 years. But after five, the inflationary increase applied to fees is a little bit sort of, you know, finger in the air. At least for five years, they will take into account certain things that are going on in the school. If they've got asset type expenditure going on, they know what sort of cash they want to raise. They can project forward, certainly also with their pupil numbers. If you think about it, you know, coming in at 11 for a senior school, they know they've pretty much got the child till they're 18. If they're that mm. sort of uh, age group, they go up to that. So there is a predictive nature. Well, it's got to be per child as well. It's got to, it's got to be this money is being paid for this child's education. This child is in year whatever now and is likely as things, everything going as planned to be there till then. It's about the child. You're paying for that child. It must be specific. So you've got to bring it in because it's a prepayment for that future supply. So what, what year is that child in? What are the fees? Um, and what are the basis for those fees going forward? And really, you've got to sort of be able to justify by saying, and that up till now has been the basis and why we've charged what we do. You know, because a child has got a certain lifespan at a particular school. Yeah, and not all the kids are going to be at the beginning. They're all going to be at different points in their education. Which is a fair point. And, and it brings us on to an interest, interesting point. If a parent pays a fee in advance, the invoice or certainly the information coming out from the school in an invoice fashion would be at a tax point free, the child possibly even starting, um, right. or possibly some of those fees setting in. Will that make a difference to the VAT man? I think it will. It depends how much in advance, you know, if it's a child who's six months old, who's you know, who's got a, a fair few years before they're going to go to a school, would that normally happen? If I was the officer looking at this or the policy people, you know, is that reasonable? I'm sure for some highfalutin schools, you know, names get put down when a, when maybe the child hasn't even been born. But yeah, these, these things are sort of a bit movie-ish, aren't they? But it has to be reasonable. And would it happen now? Or are you only introducing this to mitigate and uh, let's use the avoid word in this situation, the VAT charge? So the interesting thing about this is that this is not 
anything new in other sectors. Mm -hmm. We know if I take something very simple like a British Telecom bill, they have always, uh, for a certain period in time, asked for people to pay their uh, line rentals for 12 months, even if the line rental costs went up in the future, you've tied it in for 12 months yeah. and you're not being asked to pay any more money. So in principle, these sorts of things do exist in other industries. Yeah, of course, yeah, prepayment. I mean, it's quite interesting you mentioned British Telecom because I was looking through uh, the, the HMRC guidance, internal guidance about what and what doesn't create a tax point in consideration. And then still the leading case from about the mid to the late 1990s is a British telecom case, which was people overpaying their bill or paying too much, um, or some people deliberately paying this bill and then knowing what the quantum was going to look like going forward and paying the next couple of months or a couple of quarters in advance. And that determined whether there was a VAT liability for British Telecom or not. So if there's a consensual element with a meaningful background, why somebody is making payment and they have a they have a sort of structure of what that payment is, then that would be subject to VAT. If it's somebody who's just a bit um, forgetful and double pays their, their telephone bill, and didn't realise, or somebody else who thought, oh, I'm self-employed, I'm a bit flush this month, I'll give them a lump sum, because I don't know when I'm going to get any more money. In the second two instances, it's too abstract. It's not specific enough to a future supply. You've got to have that link, and it has to have a meaningful connection. So just to recap on fees in advance, just so that we're all quite clear, yes, in principle, if a parent pays you and a school can actually demonstrate, whether it be for five years forward, that these will potentially be what be the fees. And in theory, at the moment, without any other information coming out from Labour or HMRC, this could put schools in a position where they may not have to charge VAT on those fees should it come in in the future. Prepayment, if you really are thinking seriously about a prepayment scheme, then get moving now. Because the sooner you can show that you're doing it, and it's not just for VAT mitigation, then the more likely that you will get some, or you know, or maybe all, depending on whatever comes out, of these advanced payments exempt in line with the current rules. Okay, that deals with the VAT, and I'll deal with why I don't personally like it <laughs> in a minute. But you mentioned quite early on about composite fee schemes. Mm -hmm. Now, that is a different part of HMRC. And how do the both taxes tally? Because when we look at the composite fee scheme as a very traditional model, a parent pays, again, a lump sum. That lump sum is defined into different year groups, so different children, different years that it would cover. If I use the example of £5,000 a year, mm -hmm. what the school will do is apply a discount rate and say, for the fee that it is today, which is £5,000, I will give you a 1% discount on your £5,000. Mm -hmm. Year two comes along and the fees are now 5200 5, or £5,500 right. a day. The 1% is discount is still applied to the 5000 and the parent has to pay the difference in fees. OK, if I'm, I'm the HMRC officer. I've just heard you say that. Here's my considered response. I don't care. I live in the world of VAT. I'm only interested in the VAT rules. Unless I'm told something specifically where there's a crossover, I deal with this tax. I hear what you're saying, but my response is, I don't care. This is what I want. So we are at the realms that none of us have quite yet explored, and certainly HMRC has not yet been put in a position to challenge, should we be okay and tick the box on the VAT side, we might be getting ourselves into trouble on a benefiting kind issue. Yeah, it's called on... self-assessment. You have to run, you have to be the tax man, don't you? You collect and you file and you sign the declaration. You are the tax, you do the self-assessment. It's a case of there you go. There's the responsibility. The guidance is out there. What we don't do as a tax authority, again, role playing on the tax man, is come into your world and sort it out for you. Self-assessment. So the risks for me when I talk to you about this, Debbie, and I've certainly talked to my schools about it, is that one, parents that will give you fees in advance certainly have uh, the ability to ignore the point at the time the school tells them that this is not a foolproof um, system until more information is available. And therefore, 
when VAT comes on fees, for example, in this scenario, will conveniently forget that the school said it wasn't a foolproof system. You're going to have to write it down as well. Then, If you're writing a prepayment scheme for VAT and you're going to start doing it now, you must caveat it saying that in the event that legislation or change or, or, or something comes in that cuts through all of this, we have the right to charge you VAT in addition to the fee. Because if, it's sil if, if an amount of money payment is silent on VAT, and that's payment for a taxable supply, HMRC say you will find the VAT amount due to us out of whatever that amount is, not our problem. Yeah, you must make it exclusive of that. So you must have that caveat in whatever planning or efficiencies you're looking to introduce. Um, the other reason why I think it's a little bit precarious is, as you say, because the legislation's not here yet. And yeah. we also know that on the other side of the tax world, um, HMRC are already looking at where fees are financed from and parents that have absolutely gone into trust and paying fees out of trust all of it is being challenged at the moment by hmrc i suddenly feel a little bit that hmrc will come looking for this and we've talked about anti forestalling measures mm -hmm. what does that mean for the people listening today? okay i mean just as an example in 2012 uh, the VAT rules, the law was changed so that the approved alterations to a listed building went from zero rated to standard rated. And obviously there was an element of, oh, quick, if we prepay for what we know we're going to be doing to our listed building, we can get them at the zero rate. The changes came in, but when they were announced, there was also an announcement that legislation would be brought in so that any prepayment in that scenario, any payment in advance of the date of the full change would also be taxed at the standard rate. So if anti forestalling, which is essentially, we're going to attack your planning, if that comes in, then even a prepayment could still fail the exemption and be then subject to the new VAT rate. But of course, now we're out of Europe, it doesn't have to be 20%. A rate of VAT, you know, in theory, we can write our own, it could be 100%, it could be 1%, it doesn't have to be 20%. And maybe we do have a 5% VAT rate in the UK, the reduced rate, perhaps they may turn around and as a bit of a, um, as a lightener and say, well, we'll go, we'll call it, we'll, we'll split the difference, we'll call it middle ground between 20 and 5 who knows? We write our own rules now. We're not governed by the ultimate uh, uh, leg regulations in the EU on VAT. And um, is there a possibility, and I, this has been explored, that actually, depending on what your annual fees are, you could have tiered rates on the VAT, effectively. So a £30,000 a year school could be taxed at 20%, but a £15,000 a year school could be taxed at 10%. Yeah, of course. And of course, it could be so you could have different rates, different tiers. We've got tiers in income tax. We could have tiers in VAT. But on the VAT recovery side, because of course, if you are charging VAT at whatever rate on your income, it allows you to recover VAT on your costs. But it doesn't have to be matched. So what I mean there, say the rate of VAT <clears throat> was introduced at, say, 10%, you could still recover the full 20% rate of VAT charged to you on your costs. So it doesn't have to be a match in like for like on those rates. Exemption at the moment for, for schools, the VAT exemption does not, as you know, give you VAT recovery on your related costs. Hence the more convoluted VAT uh, compliance and the calculations to calculate how much VAT, which is generally pretty small, that can be recovered. Um, I know we're going to deal with this later, but I think it's coming through at the moment. Yeah. Um, it was talking about anti-forestalling and can this be applied retrospectively? And it was a question that you and I discussed. Yeah, you can't go back prior to... So if we do have a budget in March 25, it's not as if the, the, the VAT liability of, tw say, 20% that's been applied could go back earlier. So it's not like uh, uh, the worst case scenario in March 2025, the, the Chancellor, whoever that will be, stands up and say, oh, by the way, we're, we're going to backdate this for the last six years, you know, and it, it's not possible. You can't do that. 
but we do have the opportunity to claim input that should this come in from previous years we have for on capital items so essentially projects on good uh, uh, buildings or buildings that have been bought which were subject to VAT they have a lifespan of 10 years uh, so you will be able to claw back VAT on capital goods so that's probably the biggest upside of a change in the VAT rules it's, so it really depend on the schools themselves have they had quite big capital projects that will help mitigate the overall position uh, so we've got a few questions coming in. Um, I'm just going to pick a couple at random because um, some of them are a bit detailed, so we, we will need to take those. Oh, gosh, there are lots of questions. Um, I'm going to go to the top, to be fair. And I think one of the questions about when this is coming through, there was clarification about um, if this is brought through a Finance Act as part of the budget, does it still need to be agreed into law through the um, House of Commons and then... Yeah, yeah, it's going to have to be debated. Yeah, it's going to have to be debated. And we, you know, one of the things we haven't really gone into because we're not politicians is what if there's a coalition? Because I don't know if, for example, the Liberals would would give a green light for VAT to go on education. So it might get there might be a horse trade and they might get completely watered down. But it does have to be debated. It will have to go through the proper channels. Um, and again, a couple of questions I can see just about the slight confusion of when the schools are trying to predict forward as best they can what they think the fees will be for the service of that education, the delivery of that, that education, if they get it wrong, up or down, what does that mean when VAT is now Okay. On fees. So a subsequent payment, essentially, let's look at it that there'd be more money to charge, then that will create another tax point in the future. And the VAT treatment of that will be in line with whatever the VAT rules there are then. So that will be in our, um, our situation here, 20%. So an additional slice, or if it was a discount, it would just be a discount, but just the bare bones. You're not going to give VAT away because, of course, you didn't pay it in the first place. That's right. So just to explore that, just so that we all have a full understanding of that, Debbie, is if a parent gave you £50,000 and it was estimated, let's keep it very simple, that that would cover two years' worth of fees of which VAT was now on those. Mm -hmm. If actually with hindsight, because things have gone up a bit faster than ever, actually only covered a year and a half, the parent would have to then supplement that last term by extra money. There's now VAT on fees they will be subject to VAT on that last That term. additional tranche yeah. of the payment, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. But we haven't, the other thing we haven't gone into is the uh, the other elements apart from academia. I mean, there's, there's ideas which we see around that, which you and I have discussed. Absolutely. So I think fees in advance obviously was one, and I think we've probably, mm. and we've got more questions, but we will take that online, I'm conscious of time. But one of the other things that obviously came about quite early on was this definition of education. Mm. What does it really mean? And if you take the key things that a child gets when they're at school, it is the academics, there's music, there's sports, there's catering, and there's boarding. Mm. So if you just take those as big examples of what a child can access, depending on the type of school it is, mm -hmm. um, what does education actually cover? Well, at the moment, what you would look at is what is exempt? I mean, that's been a... a so you've got the education, school meals... Or the, for the kids, boarding, because those are uh, school trips, those are goods and services closely related to the education itself. So the education is the mothership of the exemption. And these are the things that is pulling in because they're so closely related. But we talked about, well, can they be unbundled and potentially a bit of distance created between the school? And other elements. So say, let's take that. Catering, for example, if you take catering out of the uh, education pot, it's always going to be standard rated. There's no other exemption knocking around for catering. So that's that's a done deal there. What about boarding? Well, boarding, I've seen, and we've looked at this ourselves, hasn't it? Certainly, if it's a an element of the education and boarding. I would imagine the boarding is a fairly chunky proportion of the fee. Yep. If you had a 
boarding subsidiary, so a subsidiary company from the school, so creating the distance, and you could contract for both. There's the academic element, there's the boarding. Can that be exempt as a supply of a right over land? Okay, I've seen that uh, muted. Well, for that to be exempt, it has to be a defined area for you, and it has to be exclusive for you. Now, I don't think in practical terms, there'll be enough of those two tests being met for it to be exempt. Because in a boarding, in the school's boarding, will that child have that specific area that's exclusive to them? Hard one to, to get over the line. I can't see HMRC wearing that. But um, the London YMCA was looking at this area a couple of years ago and won their case in the first tier tribunal because they said, OK, what we are providing, we think, is standard rated under supply of hotel accommodation, boarding or similar, including sleeping accommodation. Oh, so what? That's standard rated. This is what we're trying to mitigate in this this event now. But the big the big planning and the big tick for them and, and potentially for us is that there's a valuation provision, which means after 28 days, so day 29 onwards, if you've been in continuous occupation of, of that accommodation, that sleeping accommodation, from day 29, the effective rate of VAT drops to 4% from 20, and you still get full VAT recovery. So as we were talking about earlier, if you won the Euro millions and decided to leg it from your house and move into Claridge's while you considered what you're going to do, if you're going to be there for three months, after day 28, Claridge's from day 29 onwards would only charge you 4% VAT or only account for an effective rate of 4% VAT on the the room, the bathroom, etc. not on any catering, but it seemed to be your effective residence. You see, that's what the um, that's what the uh, uh, the measure is looking to to reflect. So this is where the unbundling comes into its own. So if you take a child that joins the school in September and is a boarder. Yeah. The reality is that at least up until Christmas, they will hit this 29 day rule. And therefore, a school has the opportunity to only charge them 4 percent fat on the accommodation only between, let's just for your sake, October to the point they break up in December. If the school does not rent out their room mm -hmm. or their dorm, because they're shared dormitories yeah. as well, in that December period, that 4% rate continues. Continues, because you're not breaking, you're not breaking the, um, the timeline. So even if they're not there, nobody else is either. And the, the, the payment has been made so in theory, they could turn up and, and, and use that accommodation. And again, when they go back in January, they're now still ticking along in that reduced 4% period because they haven't broken the timeline. So it's almost in the interest when schools are looking at unbundling things that the accommodation ultimately is worth more than the catering in this case. Because yeah. actually you're going to take advantage of a 4%, not a 20% if that's what the rate is, but it is something to consider for boarding yeah, schools. Yeah, I think that could be, because it's standard rated, because, you know, going back to basics, if it's a supply, it's subject to the standard rate, unless it goes in, it's got to fit in the exemptions. The exemptions are narrowly drawn. You've got to fit with all the, all the small print. So it can be quite hard to get into any exemption. But with the hotel or similar, it's been quite a lot of... Um, of case law around this because we're now in a digital age airbnb all that sort of thing but at this four percent effective rate from day 29 onwards is only in that particular area and of course it can give you a lot of benefit because you could still get full of that recovery only costs which is a really really interesting point point. and what about things like the sports you know if you hived off the sports of the mm. school for example or even you know the the uh supply of music lessons those sorts of things and put it into a trading sub and especially for the sports take advantage of the vast exemptions that's it yeah i think uh, the music i don't think there's any exemptions there because the only uh thing is at the moment is the exemption through education which is the one that looks that, that could go but sports if it was a different uh, subsidiary the sports sub so you contract with the school for the academic and you separately contract with sports subsidiary for the sports services then there is an exemption for sports services, a series of 10 or more. 
But of course, how do you operate that in practice? What if a kid doesn't want to do sports and sees this as a nice opportunity for not doing it and looking at your your phone instead? The school's got and and do you for it to be to stand up and not look artificial? The school's got to recommend that uh, it can provide it through its sport subsidiary, but that the kid, if the child doesn't want to, they can do sports with somebody else. It all becomes a little bit fraught, doesn't yeah. it? And would that sports subsidiary be doing those services for a third party? That would be helpful because that gives it a bit more of a commercial feel. And would any of this, I mean, you know, if you sit back for a minute and these are all sort of ideas, you know, without any information coming out from Labour at the moment. But I mean, would HMRC just look at this and just go, you're avoiding VAT? Well, yeah, almost certainly. But the fact is, they, they say that a lot about current rules that are in place. Hence, go into the courts. But we live in a democracy. You can challenge. You know, if you think you've got a reasonable uh, planning idea or an efficiency and it works within rules, then why not? I mean, I think especially where we are at the moment, we just see the headline, we are bringing VAT on education for independent schools. There's so much detail that would need to be teased out. So, so if you're going to do planning, if you're going to do efficiency efficiencies, at least have a look at them now at a strategic level, give them a kick around and see what the steps required in order to drill in and get them into place. In theory, could you make it work? And I think that's what I'd be looking at, not jumping straight into the full planning idea, but almost right, what is realistic here and, and kick it around. And find maybe people like your good self to look outside the world of VAT and find other reasons to kick it around. Because it's a critical friend thing, this type of thing, isn't it? It's best to have these challenging uh, discussions, the what ifs, in an environment when everybody's upfront and robust. But ultimately, we're all on the same side. So you've got a couple of questions coming through. One of them was about the accommodation idea, Debbie, mm -hmm. and it is, is it realistic to consider the accommodation time not being broken when the occupier could not return during a school vacation period as a staff would not be in place? But the room, effectively, is what we're saying, is it's allocated not being, to that child. Yeah, and it's not let to anyone else. So uh, it depends how, how much of a, I could say if I was an officer of HMRC, that's where I'd be looking to argue, saying this is not what, why it isn't. But there's probably reasons for a hotel. If you booked a hotel, say a hotel closed for two weeks in January to paint and decorate, et cetera, but you wanted to live in it for six months, maybe there'd be a lower rate, but they can't let it to anyone else. Um, so again, another one on the uh 4% that you were talking about, Debbie, for the 4% exception post day 29, would that hold also for shared bedrooms where pupils may have to share? So it's that shared dormitory, element. It's, yeah, because it's sleeping accommodation. So uh, if you were in a um, uh, a bunk house in the Lake District and you were paying because you're doing the Duke of Edinburgh award. You're in shared accommodation. You would hope that you'd at least get the bed for you. And I think I think where the question lies, just to be very specific, Debbie, yeah. is that you've got full time borders and you might have schools that have weekly borders. Yeah. And the weekly borders is in my head a bit more of a rotation unless you have a child that is paying for weekly boarding and is consistently boarding. But the reality is we're looking at full time borders that have the, the same bed, the same. But also the weekly borders. There's nobody breaking it on Saturday and Sunday. I'm assuming that the, the, the weekly borders, it just means at the weekend, there's not many children there. Some of them don't do full weeks. So I think it just yeah. depends, doesn't it, on, on what you're looking at. Mm -hmm. um, I think we covered the one about vacation again on this, about whether if someone was on vacation, but it's the bed. So that was that one. Um, disregarding payment of fees in advance or, pay, pay, you know, parents simply be required to pay more if that is on fees and I think that's a conversation you and I had what in terms of the um where where the cost yeah who yeah pass, so it's, it's a case of isn't it it's HMRC will want if it's if a supplier is subject to VAT <laughs> the supplier 
accounts for it. Whether or not they pass it on, or they pass it on a bit, or they pass it on, you know, it's a price point. It's what's the price point? Because all there's been there's loads of cases in all areas which you've looked at, because one of some of the biggest tax areas are where it's sold to private individuals. So the high street selling biscuits, uh, kids' clothes, what's the price point where kids' clothes and adults' clothes, Subway. We saw that, didn't we? About loads of food because where people are by B2C sales or private consumer is the customer, there's real tax. So if you don't have to charge and account for tax, if you don't have to account for tax as the supplier, then your price point suddenly releases up a big margin. Do you keep it? Do you pass it on or do you split it? And I think that's the sort of thing we're looking at in the schools, isn't it? Who's going to fund the VAT? Because HMRC, the world of VAT is that the VAT registered entities out there are collecting the VAT and doing the legwork under self-assessment in order to pass it back. That VAT is not yours. You're the unpaid tax collector. So we had a, a <laughs> administrative question based probably on today, on, on what we do today. So if we go back to the fees and advance scheme, let's just say a parent's paid up for five years. And within that period in year two, 25, 26, there's now VAT on fees. Yeah. Um, ultimately, the school has entered into an arrangement. Let's just say that the paperwork around that arrangement is accepted by the VAT man. So the reality is the school in 2526 will create an invoice for the parent, show them what they've paid in advance, but there will be no VAT on that invoice mm -hmm. because they are not subject to VAT because they have paid in advance. Yeah, because the it's it's essentially what is the tax point for that prepayment? The earlier of the invoice or the the money, the money, the payment. The if if you're looking at prepayment, that money passing to the school crystallizes that date. So I think the I think the question here was. We, would we have to stop the terminal invoice? No, you would have the terminal invoice, but you would not. You would have a zero uh, yeah. VAT rate attached to that yeah. invoice. For that and you would cross-reference this on the narrative invoice against uh, the pre invoice against payment made on X date. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I mean, the one thing just to take an aside here, um, which most schools will recognise this comment, um, the parents that are in a position to give you fees in advance of that nature are probably the same parents that could afford the 20% VAT. Mm. What we're trying to do is save the parents that are sitting at the bottom rung of that, and they're not the ones that are going to be able to afford years of fees in advance, unfortunately. Um, so whilst this scheme might work, um, absolutely. It's not helping the parents that you're trying to save, if I'm being honest, if you look mm -hmm. at it from, from that point of view. Mm -hmm. But that's a whole other conversation, I think, mm -hmm. um, ultimately. We had a question on... Um, about bursaries, wasn't it? There was, I'll try yeah. to find that one. Um, I mean, really, you're looking at... If, 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 a, if there's different levels of fee fees, depending on whether some of them are subsidised or part bursary or whatever... You know, it's just it's just how you arrive at the the payment. It's it's if it's VAT, but if VAT is now levied on education, it's just if there's a bursary that that brings down the payment, it doesn't change the fact it's the liability, not the not the quantum. So would that be then just for clarification on this particular question? It's about does the VAT. So if you're in the realms of a VAT situation now. Is the VAT on the gross fee, then you put your bursary and scholarship under that and then you get to a net fee, or do you apply the VAT on the net amount um, ultimately? Well, ultimately, you'd say, well, that's the pay mechanism, isn't it? It's how the school, uh, how the school calculates the final figure that you're going to pay. So you would, that's the price, that's the consideration, that's where the 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 VAT treatment should sit. Which is on the net, then, in yeah, reality. It's, yeah, because it's how you, you know, how you figure out how you arrive how you at got the, to your... Yeah. yeah, and of course, just to put it into context again, the schools that are operated by local authorities, the academies, et cetera, where free schools, where they are not charging 
for education, they, they get full VAT recovery on their costs. So an academy gets full VAT recovery on its costs because there's a special VAT regime that gives them that back because it's it it's because they do it they're doing it and it's not doesn't have a business like or a commercial um rationale so they get the VAT back and, and my understanding is labor is not looking at anything there so there's no because there's no extra VAT to give them mm. but it doesn't look like there's any any measures to <coughs> to bring them more into line what the independent schools will be doing yeah, yeah, they're, they're boys. <laughs> Excuse me. We've got another question here, just because again, it just takes us on to a slightly different area. To, so I'm making sure we get a broad range of, of questions here. But one of the things that uh, has been muted as well is actually we've got to be a little bit careful because there is, if that comes in, there's the opportunity to claim input that. What happens if there's a tariff, mm. i.e., just a tax, you know, on on what it is? It's got. Is it that? Yeah. I mean, it could be uh, that it's it's. Well, it's, it could be, well, instead of putting VAT on it, we're just going to put a, a, a flat a flat levy. Which is the question here. If yeah. they do a levy instead of VAT, would capital building back claim, no. claim still apply? No, because the levy is not that. So it's what, give, okay, the rhetorical question is, what gives anybody the right to recover that? It's costs that can be seen to a link with something that's taxable, i.e. 0%, 5% or 20%, or if indeed they they come up with a new rate. A levy is not that, even though it's extra payment, that unless the rules say this levy will give you a right to recover. So new, again, just writing something new. Um, some concerns over what might be deemed as avoidance schemes. Um, again, a question about, do we have to be very careful how we advertise fees? Two parents to avoid it being seen as an anti-avoided scheme. Yeah, well, it's two things, isn't it? It needs to have substance. So if you only do something for VAT purposes and it has no other rationale or, or use, then that's too artificial. If you're only doing it and if you're advertising it as a VAT avoidance, then, um, you know, that's really not the best PR for anything. No, absolutely. Again, uh, as I think we've discussed, that many schools already operate fees and advance schemes. Um, are there any generic recommendations? I think the point that Debbie was saying is that you have to be very spot on about what your agreements say and how you propose. And how also, what about flipping it the other way? As the auditor, as the head of education, how are you going to look at these these planning measures when doing an audit because if you're not happy how, where does that sit in the world of uh, of giving a um whatever bill of health you want to give to your uh, client world, world of risk i'm coming to you Debbie. <laughs> excuse me um do you believe that if schools have to pay have to charge vat which changes their status Will they have to then pay business rates? Surely this will must be increased. Oh, because the, the Labour Party has also talked about withdrawing charitable status for schools, aren't they? And yeah, I, I think this is a longer discussion. I, I am conscious of the time we did yeah. start late. It is two o'clock. But I think charitable status absolutely is potentially up for grabs. I mean, they haven't absolutely said it. You know, why why worry about charitable status when they can just take away your VAT? You know, it, there, there's so many things they could do. Until we see a manifesto, until we see detail, mm. honestly, I have no idea what Labour are, are doing. Um, what happens if a parent pays fees for five years in advance and decides they want to take their child out of the school after three? Can they get a refund? Absolutely, that's just standard policies and, and conditions. The school cannot keep your money, um, depending obviously on how, how their fees have transpired mm. over the time and what extras your child gets. Um, thoughts on that on day schools versus boarding school fees, please. Oh, we've covered that, sorry. Yeah. Um, uh, I think we've covered most of these questions. Um, and I think there are things, you know, I've got so many questions on top-ups, um, you know, ultimately subject to VAT. And again, it's all about planning. If we get this in before anything's announced, um, you could find yourselves in a situation where um, it does combat the VAT part. I did say to Debbie as well, you know, let's just say so we don't miss a trick. You know, there are parents out there that 
actually quite happy to put fees into those schools for 10 years. You know, if you think about on an average child, if they join you at four, leave at 13, there might be people in a position to uh, give you advance fees for that period. And if you think of 11 um, to 18, that's, you know, eight years worth of fees potentially. Um, you can see parents planning. Yeah. Um, it comes down to the predicted Well, if fees. say you introduced it now, say you really went to town and, and drilled into a, a pre-payment scheme in place, was scheme process in place and you thought well well if we can get pupils for 10 years if they didn't in, in the um if they did introduce uh a top a, a ceiling well you still you've tried it doesn't mean it's not like oh if you put 10 years we lose it all and the ceiling will just the ceiling will come in they get another theory say the ceiling is five if they accept that it can be five years, well, that'll cut through your 10 years. But if you don't ask, you don't get, we've got to put a meaningful basis behind any planning idea. And, and I think that's the detail of the schools are missing, which I'm sure they <laughs> start to ask about. One last one, really, really quickly. Yeah. Overseas students. Yeah, overseas students, doesn't matter. The place of supply is here. For other areas of that, the place of supply is where the customer is based. But for education, it's where they are physically coming to receive their education. So if UK, overseas students, level playing field. Thank you very much. Thank you for bearing with us. Very sorry about losing 10 minutes at the beginning. Um, but we will try and answer all the questions that have come through if we haven't already. Um, and we will send that out to you and I will have Debbie's details on there because and we're monitoring this are we monitoring this area so we're as keen as you are to find out when there's a little bit more visibility and we will share that as well with our thoughts you know so as a you know we want to run with this as well so as details come out as as, as things we will reframe our messages so thank you very much um, and please feel free to contact us if there's any detail that you want from anything that we've discussed today. Thank you all. Thank you. Bye. Bye.